very warm welcome to you all and thank you all very much indeed for coming along here today. I do appreciate the, the effort that you've made. Um, before I begin my talk this evening, let me just say something quickly that I hope will be helpful. Quite simply, if you have any questions that arise from this evening's talk, please don't be shy with me. Instead, always feel free to ask your questions whenever you see me around the ship, morning, afternoon or evening, or if you see me out and about on shore excursions. Again, my attitude is that I'm not just here to do the 45 minute talks. I'm always available to receive your questions if you wish. If you have any immediate and burning questions that you just have to ask me right after this talk, that's no problem. I'll be taking those outside the theatre. I can't take them in the stage area because the guys have to change the, the, uh, the stage setting. But outside the theatre, I'll give you as much time as you wish. But I have to say, whenever I'm, I come to Norway with cruise guests, I always uh, like to talk about Norwegian wildflowers. It, it's a passion of mine because they are really one of the great pleasures of any Norwegian adventure, as far as I'm concerned. But today I'm going to offer you a gentle introduction to the subject of Norwegian wildflowers. And the thing I want to emphasise in this talk this evening is the astonishing variety of wildflowers we can enjoy in Norway, which are available for, for us all on this, this cruise. And to present my talk in some kind of a logical uh, arrangement, I'm going to start off in the southernmost part of Norway, and then I'm going to follow the route of this cruise, really, going further and further north, uh, to the northernmost part of the, the nation. And I'm going to focus in on the wildflowers which are considered to be the county flowers of each one of the 19 counties of Norway. So let's just start uh, right away. I'm going to start in the far southeastern tip of Norway, in the county of Ostfold, where we find the wildflower, which Norwegians call Lekulonval, but which the rest of us know, of course, Lily of the Valley. And it's appreciated rightly for its gorgeous sweet scent. But equally rightly, of course, it is avoided because it is poisonous, of course. You'll usually find them amid the uh, partial shade of Norwegian woodland, and we can say that Lily of the Valley is a mesophile. In other words, it grows best in moderate temperatures. So that, that's absolutely no problem in Norway for most of the time, thanks to the Gulf Stream, of course, which uh, bathes pretty much uh, all of Norway uh, with moderate temperatures for most of the year anyway. Having said that, though, uh, you can find Lily of the Valley as far up in the Norwegian mountains as up to 5,000 feet above sea level. But it loves soils which are silty or or sanding and also somewhere between acid and moderately alkaline. And if you were uh, to, to look up the, the, uh, the books published by, for example, the Royal Horticultural Society, you will read that they reckon that Lily of the Valley prefers moderately alkaline soils over any other type. But now let's move forward because there's a lot to cover in this evening's talk to the extreme southeast of Norway now. Um, slightly to the north of Ostfold, where we find our next county, and that is Eckers House, uh, where we uh, find the, the, uh, the county wildflower is Anemone Americana, or to the Norwegians, they would call it Blavis. And uh, if you're into your scientific names, you'll recognise it as Heptatia nobilis. It's a member of the Buttercup family. But uh, setting aside those names, now I've now got some explaining to do, haven't I? Because the big question is what is a native plant from North America doing as an adopted county flower in Norway? Well, the answer is a lovely story. It's the Blavis, to, to use its Norwegian name, is a beautiful bloom that usually comes out in around uh, February in Norway. So it's become a bit of a family tradition in southern Norway for everyone, the whole, whole family, to go out hunting into the woods around February time to find the first Blavis flowers and therefore the first signs of springtime. So finding Blavis really is a real sign in southern Norway that winter is at last over and spring is heading in this way. 
but you really cannot blame the Norwegians for falling in love with Blavis, can you? Because it's basically a blue version of Edelweiss, isn't it? Of course, to us, and I, I come from the United Kingdom, uh, 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 one of our favourite uh, la- names for it is liver leaf. And uh, crystal wort is, is another uh, name for, for this, isn't it? But uh, wherever it, it grows, it will grow no higher than about four inches tall. So sometimes you have to go careful and look for it carefully. You'll find out that it's uh, all over the southern Norwegian woodlands in the spring. And I'd recommend that just so you go out uh, looking for, for Blavis because it is just um, so beautiful. There, there are subtle hues of uh, violets and purples as well uh, within uh, the, the overall umbrella uh, term of it, uh, the, the Heptatia species. But now because I'm determined to uh, include all the uh, wildflowers from each one of the 19 Norwegian counties this evening. I'm moving on once again to uh, from the, the beautiful woodland of Acres House. Now I want to look at the county flower of Oslo, uh, Oslo Nor- Norway's capital city, and that is mountain clover, or if you like your uh, scientific names, Trifolium fonta- uh, montanum. Now the main reason why mountain clover just does so well in mountainous environments is because it has got a tremendously strong tap root. So that root can really get a very firm foothold even on the most challenging of slopes. And if you spend your time watching each individual mountain clover plant, you will actually notice that each plant takes two years to get through its life cycle. So in the first year, All uh, it ever does is to produce leaves, so you won't see any flowers in the first year. But the best time of of year to go out searching for mountain clover, I'd say round about now, actually. You may have seen some in around uh, Giranga. Midsummer is perfect for mountain clover hunting. So basically, I'm talking about picnicking weather, aren't I? It's never really much of a challenge to find mountain clover because when it's in full flower, uh, you can find uh, mountain clover uh, plants actually reach up higher than just about any other mountain meadow plant that you will ever see. And uh, you'll you'll see the finding of uh, mountain clover um, is fairly easy. Also, you'll uh, find uh, honeybees and bumblebees buzzing around these beautiful plants. And that's because mountain clover is uh, is, uh, pollinated by those bees. In actual fact, mountain clover will be really popular among bee populations because the overall shape of mountain clover flowers makes it really easy for the bees to access the nectar. And by the way, uh, if you've fallen in love to, with other parts of Scandinavia, you'll find mountain clover in southwestern uh, Finland uh, and also around the Aland Islands as well. We've worked out that the, uh, the main reason why mountain clover has worked its way inland is because the tiny seeds actually get picked up in the swirl of air caused by traffic flows. So over the years, a mountain clover works its way away from the mountains and in into just about any nook and cranny uh, that, uh, that is available to it in those uh, um, with that amazingly strong tap root that can uh, get a hold. But now I want to uh, move uh, a few miles uh, to the north of Oslo through the, the uh, Norwegian county of Hedmark and. Uh, this is the, uh, the landscape I'm, I'm talking about here. If you want me to sum up Hedmark in, in uh, one uh, slide, this is the one I've chosen. And the adopted county flower in Hedmark is this, the fireweed. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear it given uh, the uh, alternative names of Great Willow Herb or Rose Bay Willow Herb, but in Norway it's called Gay Trams. And I hope this picture is particularly useful because it shows clearly some of the, the best types of environment in which we find fireweed. And it's an area of uh, woodland where only a few months previously there was a tremendous forest fire. And you can see that fireweed doesn't just colonise the recently burned area in small clumps of ones or twos. Instead, it basically completely takes over almost the entire area. And of course, when we think how the seeds uh, got out to this uh, isolated patch of woodland... 
or part of the answer is that they are carried there on the wind or in bird fe uh, feathers of, of birds. But the main reason why we'd find fireweed sprouting out of the ground so soon after a major forest fire is because those uh, uh, seeds from the previous generation of fireweed, which died back after they were colonised, the, the same areas, those, those seeds uh, remained in the ground. And, unbelievably almost, they remained viable too. So these are pretty remarkable seeds I'm talking about. With an ability to put themselves into that kind of seed hibernation in the forest soil until the next forest fire quite literally sparks them into life again. And I hope it's clear from this picture that I'm sharing with you that fireweed is an extremely successful pioneer species. So really, uh, all fireweed needs to survive in an open area is plenty of light. Uh, but uh, sometimes you read it in the Norwegian newspapers that groups of people actually go out to pick the spring shoots of fireweed and they actually... Uh, uh, clean those uh, shoots and they have them on their salads as well uh, alongside other greens it's a Norwegian speciality and so they, they peel the shoots and they eat them absolutely raw so they don't use, lose any of the nutrients. And actually, uh, we've, we've done a bit of uh, an analysis and uh, it's not just uh, an idiosyncrasy of the Norwegians, it's a really good idea because fireweed uh, shoots have a, a good level of vitamin A and vitamin C as well. In actual fact, I've even known several people, Norwegian friends of mine, who like to add the, the shoots from fireweed to their dog's food. So... <laughs> It helps the family pet as well. And then there are other stories when people actually rub those young shoots into cuts in their skin or even pus-filled boils. And again, the scientific analysis shows that's a really good idea because, there, yes, there are medicinal benefits from actually having do, done so. Those uh, uh, shoots do help the cuts and the boils. So who knew? But another culinary use of fireweed in use, uh, involves uh, gathering the plant's roots, not the shoots, but the roots this time, scraping them uh, clean and once again using them in family salads or on, on picnics. Although I have to say that I've tasted some of those roots, ladies and gentlemen. They are very bitter indeed. The kindest thing you could say is that they are an acquired taste. But that's fine. But uh, uh, another thing is that the honey from local bees that feed on their patch of fireweed does have a beautiful and distinctive flavour as well. So the more you dig into the fireweed story, the more fascination there is. Anyway, I need to move on, don't I? Time is always against me. Let me now show you on my map where we're off to now on our wildflower adventure. We're going to Opland. And if you wanted me to sum up what Opland looks like, well, I hope you'll agree with me. It's pretty stunning uh, landscape, really. The County Administration uh, Centre, you might recognise the name Lillehammer. Now, that, that's associated with all sorts of uh, amazing skiing events, isn't it? But when the snow melts, we can enjoy the pleasures afforded by the beautiful wildflower. Hours. And this one comes under various names. Lady of the Snows is one. Arctic Violet is another. Spring Pusk Flower or even Pulsatia Velalis. The Norwegians have their own name, Mogop. I'm going to carry on with Mogop. I like that name. If we follow the, the Norwegians in that, we, we can find that Mogop is uh, not only in uh, mountainous habitats, it's all over the, the county and, of course, elsewhere. But this is the adopted wildflower of uh, Opland. And uh, there you, you'll find that, that uh, Mogop, or Arctic Violet, if you prefer, will really only grow up to four inches tall, no higher than that on average. And they'll, they'll, they'll clumps uh, of it, you know, we'll find it about four inches wide as well. And interestingly, it's semi evergreen. It's also a perennial too. So what that means is basically it lives for more than two years. And if you want to know the best time of year to find a mogop, well we're a little bit late actually, but early spring. So next vacation, uh, if you're in, into these, these beautiful wildflowers, early spring is a great time to come along. Now let's move on because there really is so much to enjoy from Norwegian wildflowers. Let's have a look at the Norwegian county of Beskarud. And once again, if you ask me to sum up Beskarud County in just one picture, 
well, this is the one I've chosen. So we've got mountains, we've got forests, we've got rivers, we've got waterfalls in Baskerud. We also have their chosen wildflower, which the Norwegians called uh, Stornok Rosa. But for, uh, for the rest of us, we might recognise it as the European white water lily, wouldn't we? Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are wondering why I have chosen to show you yet, uh, or not, not chosen, uh, to show you yet another alpine wildflower, please remember the structure of my talk is to tell you about the county wildflowers which have been chosen by the, the people of each county in Norway each one of the 19 counties. And so within the Norwegian county of Baskerud, they voted for the European white water lily, sometimes we'd know as uh, the, the, uh, the white lotus or the, the white water rose, um, or, or uh, the, the white nenuphar, or even nenuphar alba, so many d different names. But the European white water lily, it's so adaptable. Yes, you can find it in very shallow ponds of... Um, uh, up, up no uh, shallower than uh, 12 inches deep, and yet the roots can d develop as uh, deep as five feet. So it can find uh, space in, in uh, ponds five feet deep. So yes, it is a very adaptable and fascinating lily. The leaves will grow up about 12 inches uh, from one side to the other, and uh, there's, uh, as with lots of wildflowers, the European water lily has been used for uh, herbal medicine over many centuries. But the, with the European white water lily, those medicine experts, ladies and gentlemen, had to be very careful in the way they were treating it because one treatment of the uh, lily will lead to a, a sedative and another will lead to an aphrodisiac. So yes, they had to be very careful indeed. In actual fact, if you look into the medieval uh, history books, you'll find that for many years on end, uh, monks and nuns actually used the roots of European water lily as an anaphrodisiac. In other words, they used it to quell the libido. So I'll leave that, <laughs> that uh, subject uh, and move on. Now, let me uh, show you uh, the tiny red dot right at the bottom there. Uh, one of the smallest of the Norwegian counties, but no less fascinating for that. I'm taking you now to Vestfold. And last night, actually interesting conversations that I, I always have on Viking cruise ships. Several uh, cruise guests were kind enough to ask me a fascinating question about Viking burial sites. And just as a, a footnote to that, before I carry on with the wildflowers, um, they were asking me wh where some of the, the best uh, sites are to find Viking burials well they are where we are right now in Vestfold and some amazing burial sites were discovered in 2003 2004 60 Viking burial sites were discovered but today yes I am carrying on with wild flowers and stunning landscapes in which they're set but once again a surprise ladies and gentlemen when the good people of Vestfold were asked to choose their wild flower so-called they surprised us all because they chose the year European beech tree. So the European uh, beech tree doesn't qualify as a, a wild flower, but certainly a, a wild plant. I, you, please don't blame me for these surprises because uh, you have to take the matter up with the, the, the good people of Vestfold who voted for that as their so-called county wild flower or wild plant, we, we can say. But uh, the, 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 uh, the European beech is absolutely fascinating. Of course, you don't need me to tell you that it's completely beautiful. And uh, if you're into your long woodland walk, are surrounded by European beech trees. Well, who can blame anyone? They, they are, they're, they're also known as the common beech, by the way, exactly the same tree. But uh, these guys, these wonderful trees, can grow up to 160 feet tall. And from one side of their trunk to the other, they can actually be 10 feet, uh, and 10 feet in diameter. I can also tell you that it takes, on average, 30 years for these trees to reach maturity. But when they do so, they can actually live for about 300 years in total. So if these trees could speak, what stories they would tell. Now, one of the interesting things to remember, there's so much fascination about the European beech tree, but uh, the, the, when the leaves die in autumn, the trees do not shed their leaves. So instead, the European beech actually retains its own dead leaves until the following spring, when the winds blow those dead leaves away. And this process, a fascinating process, isn't it, of retaining dead leaves until the following spring is called marsense. So we can think of this, the, the 
dead leaves and uh, marcent foliage, can't we? When it uses dead leaves uh, to protect the tree during the sometimes punishing winter temperatures. When European beech trees and many other plants really need all the protection they, they can get hold of, even if it is from their own dead leaves. But another surprising thing about the European beech tree is around, uh, not, not the, the branches, but below ground, its roots. They are surprisingly shallow and they also splay out as well uh, around the tree in all directions. But there's another surprise as well because when scientists take a close look at what's going on around the European beech tree roots, they find that the, the, the tree actually strikes up a very close two-way relationship with all sorts of woodland fungi. So both the fungi and the tree benefit from this remarkable uh, relationship. Anyway... Time to move on to our next Norwegian county, and that's the county of Telmark. And again, I want to set the scene of Telmark um, by this, uh, this, uh, this picture that I, I think sums up the, the, the county. It's an absolute delight and a, a pleasure for all us keen hill walkers as well. But in terms of the ca uh, county flower of Telmark, it is the elder-flowered uh, orchid for the Norwegians. It's called Sostamareland. And uh, the first thing to say about elderflower orchid is that it's just so adaptable because uh, you're just as likely to see it on your travels as far south as Portugal, would you believe? and as far east as Poland uh, and the Ukraine as well. So, yes, it is very adaptable indeed. But uh, whenever we find them in, in Norway or in anywhere else, these guys will grow no taller than 14 to 15 inches tall on average. But the next time you are able to see elderflower or orchids, have a careful look at their leaves, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, what you'll notice is that each leaf completely surrounds uh, its part of the orchid orchid stem and uh, with that arrangement of leaves we can say that the, the, these leaves are amplexical um, and uh, because in other words they, they, they uh, the leaves wrap themselves around the stem and uh, you, you can uh, expect to see about uh, four to seven of those amplexicole leaves on each uh, of the, the mature elderflower orchids, which you um, may encounter. Um, but uh, where are the best places to go to uh, find elderflower orchids? Well, the, the, the uh, pastures around uh, fresh or, or dry meadows are absolutely perfect. That's a really good place to start. Alternatives might be light woodland as well, or scrubland too. But now, once again, I have to move on, and uh, we'll, st we'll still keep in the south of uh, Norway for a little while longer. I'm still going to stay in the county of Ostagda. And as you can see from my picture, what Ostagda lacks in mountains, it more than makes up for in vast areas of beautiful and fascinating woodland. And uh, with all that in mind, I can tell you that the official wild flower of Ostagda is, excuse me... <coughs> Honeysuckle, which in, in uh, Norwegian is Vivendel. But uh, some people uh, still call honeysuckle by their alter the alternative names of woodbine. You still hear that name often, don't you? In southern Norway, it it's the, it's really is the most northerly limit for honeysuckle in Europe. Although we find a few patches, a very few patches, in southern Sweden as well. But one of the amazing things about honeysuckle uh, in, in the woods is that these guys can grow easily up to 20 feet tall when they're left undisturbed as it twines its way uh, around uh, other trees uh, that, that it encounters. But apart from uh, finding wild honeysuckle in woodland, You'll find it in hedgerows, as well as scrubland as well. But another thing that we need to remember about uh, the pollination of wild uh, honeysuckle and it is not just the bees that pollinate it because uh, the moths in the local area are also major contributors to the pollination process. But now, once again, we may have to move on because I've got 19 counties to get through this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's move on once again. I'm going to take you uh, uh, to uh, Vestagda, which is the, the most uh, southerly of all the Norwegian counties. And as my picture shows, when the weather is fine, there are few places in the whole of Europe which, in my opinion, are more beautiful than the county of Vestagda. 
But once again, if you're expecting Vest Agda to have some amazing uh, Norwegian wildflower associated with it, which are chosen by the people of the county to represent their, their county, well, we're in for a surprise, ladies and gentlemen, because who on earth would have thought that they'd chose the English oak as their so-called wild flower? Well, wild plant. They're, they're, they're being a little bit uh, imaginative here. How can we make sense of that fascinating choice? Well, for us Brits, we would call it the English oak. The French, though, would call it the French oak. I won't, I won't pursue that line of argument. But uh, so the, the English, the so-called English oak is not really uh, as English as many of us Brits might imagine. It's far more of a European tree, one of the most beautiful. But uh, why else might the Norwegians adopt an English or French or European oak? Quite simply, it's one of the most stunningly beautiful trees in the whole of Europe. That's a good reason to choose it. Also, with the warming benefit of the Gulf Stream uh, coming across the Atlantic Ocean, it makes the growing of these trees very easy indeed. So oak trees are a very pleasing contrast to all the endless coniferous trees which Norway has in great abundance. Of course, for the Norwegians, they have their own name, the Soma Elk. But for me, one of the most fascinating facts about the, uh, the oak tree is the uh, astonishing number of insect species which mature oaks su uh, support. They can, uh, each oak can actually support up to 400 different insect species. That is a surprise, isn't it? For each tree, that is. So it, it's just one, one of the great examples of biodiversity that, that we, can, we can find. One of the greatest uh, examples of biodiversity of insects per single plant plant anywhere in Europe. But on top of that, acorns are such a val uh, valuable food source for all sorts of mammals, but all sorts of birds as well, such as the jay, but many others as well. In fact, it was the jay that was the main propagator of oaks uh, before humankind came on, on th th the scene. Anyway, having taken you to the southernmost part of Norway, I am now going to make my way further north, ladies and gentlemen, and that means that we have to encounter the, the, uh, the, the first county of our northernmost trek into Rogaland. And as you can see from this extraordinary picture, uh, this is now the land of astonishing fields. And this field scene is from Pulpit Rock, high above Lisa Field. In actual fact, the top of Pulpit Rock is just a hair's breadth almost short of two thousand feet above the waters of Least Field. So when the weather is good, ladies and gentlemen, the views are breathtaking. Highly recommended for a future Norwegian vacation. Anyway, the uh, wildflower chosen by the good people of Rogaland County is the cross-leafed heath. Some of you, again, may have seen many of these species today if you went on, on a hike today around uh, Geranga. Uh, but uh, to, to use its uh, scientific name, Erica tetralix. Uh, to the Norwegians, though, of course, they have their own name for these wildflowers, Klok Kellyeng. But uh, the cross-leafed uh, heath is, is one of those amazingly adaptable plants, always endlessly fascinating, where you find it. Always full of surprise, but uh, you can recognize these uh, from the, you might see the same plant in your uh, travels in southern uh, Portugal, as well as as far north as, as Norway. You might also find them in uh, boggy meadows in Austria and Switzerland too. So anywhere there's a bog or uh, a wet heathland or damp coniferous forest, the chances are that you might come across uh, cross-leaved heaths. Now, if you read the books about cross-leaf heath, you'll probably see that they are often described as a sub-shrub. Now, I need to explain what a sub-shrub is, don't I? A sub-shrub is basically a type of dwarf uh, type of shrub. So whenever you come across sub-shrub, you could expect to see a, a shrub that is stumpy, yes, wooden, uh, woody, uh, and a woody type of, of stem. So other examples of sub-shrubs that we come uh, easily to mind. Well, lavender is a good example, isn't it? Periwinkle's another one. Various thyme uh, species, you know, the, the, uh, the herb, and cranberries, that, that's also on the subshrub list. So they are all subshrubs, just like uh, the cross-leaved uh, heath. But now, 
I need to move on again. And once again, I've got no choice, have I? I need to move further north. And this uh, uh, still within the, the, uh, the, the southwestern bulge of Norway. This is the county of Hordaland. And judging from my summary picture of Hordaland, uh, you'll see that, yes, of course, we are still in glorious field territory. And the field that I'm showing you is Hardanger Field, just a few miles south of Bergen. So now you know exactly where I'm talking about, don't you? Hardanger Field is actually extraordinary, 111 miles inland from the North Atlantic. So to sail along Hardanger Field when the weather's fine is one of the great pleasures of that part of southwestern Norway. Anyway, within the, uh, with, with those introductions to the county out of the way, let me introduce you to their chosen wildflower. Uh, primrose or Primula uh, vulgaris, if you like your scientific names. And uh, although a uh, primrose looks so delicate, it is so, once again, highly adaptable. So never be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, if you find them uh, anywhere between southern uh, Portugal, the Faroe Islands, moving further north, central Europe, Germany, Ukraine, the Balkans. But you'll also find it in uh, North Africa. Certainly Algeria has quite a, a, a lot of uh, communities of primrose as well. So, yes, they do surprise us by their amazing uh, adaptability, resilience uh, too. But perhaps part of the secret in the, this fascinating primrose success story of their adaptability is that it's learned to keep its head down in, in times of, of trouble. So it'll never grow any higher than between 4 to 12 inches in height, uh, even in, in the most ideal of conditions. And one of the essential things uh, about uh, the, the, the primrose, when you kneel down, always enjoy its magical scent. Highly recommended. But uh, while you're close to a uh, primrose, Please have a careful look at the, the flowers because uh, scientists actually call this type of flower actinomorphic. Now, when I come across uh, in any uh, name like that, or I use any name like that, yes, of course, it's always great for Scrabble players because you put actinomorphic down, you've got the game won, haven't you? But actinomorphic, what on earth does it mean? Um, I need to explain myself. Basically, it means it's a star-shaped flower. And we can see that uh, this, this applies definitely to the primrose, doesn't it? But this idea idea of labelling flowers as actinomorphic is just one way of classifying the shape or the symmetry of, of flowers, um, and it's just a, a fascinating way of categorising them. But uh, the final thing to say about primrose uh, is uh, where to go looking for them. Woodland, definitely. Uh, shaded hedgerows, yes, a very good chance of seeing these beautiful uh, um, uh, plants, which, by the way, the Norwegians call kajaksmer. But uh, now, as always, I've got to move on, haven't I? 19 counties to cover in just 45-minute talk. But uh, I'm now going to the uh, Norwegian county of Sognefjorden, and uh, where you can see that the, uh, the, the field uh, landscapes are absolutely breathtaking. The one I'm showing you here is uh, Ålandsfjord, 18 miles long and full of fascination, I assure you. As far as the, uh, the wild flowers go, the county of Sognefjorden uh, gave... Uh, made its choice with foxgloves, always endlessly beautiful uh, and fascinating. First thing that we need to remember about the foxgloves is they complete their si uh, life cycle in just a two-year cycle. So that means we can, we can think of them as biennial plants, can't we? Two years. Uh, and uh, I, I think that most people associate uh, foxgloves really only with uh, shades of purple, don't they? So you might be surprised when you come across shades of pink as well, rose colours in all their heartbreaking uh, su subtlety, yellows as well, and white too. Um, What's the best time of uh, year to go looking for your fox uh, gloves in, in the woodland? Uh, I would say early summer. So once again, you have to think of a, your, your next Norwegian vacation to, to uh, see these guys. But now let's move further north, this time to the, uh, the Norwegian county of Mora Romsdal. And as you can see, we're right in the mountains now. They're pretty amazing, aren't they? But the wildflower that's associated with this county of Mora Romsdal is the pyramidal sack. So many species to enjoy right around uh, Norway. So, it, so one of the 19 counties was bound to choose it as their county flower. Um, Any time between May and June, it, you will see these what beautiful uh, 
wild wildflowers at their best with, with amazing intricate rosettes measuring about eight eight inches uh, across but with very distinctive white uh, flowers which can grow up to about two feet high so you don't have to go groveling around on the ground on, on uh, all, all fours to see these pretty much uh, always in mountainous territory that's their favored habitat and uh, because the county of Moore Romsdal uh, is that, that basically it mountainous environments but having said that do not be surprised ladies and gentlemen to come across some species of pyramidal saxifrage growing right up into the arctic beyond the arctic circle um not only in Norway uh, uh, either, um, right across Scandinavia as well, and Iceland too. So once again, we've got an adaptable species on our hands. But now, once again, get on back on, on board because we are going further north, ladies and gentlemen, to our next Norwegian county. This is Sol Trondelag. And although my picture makes a Sol Trondelag uh, look uh, almost completely deserted, it might surprise you that just over half of the population of Sol Trondelag lives in just one city, and that's the city of Trondheim. So it's a city of about 200,000 people. But as far as wildflowers go, they have chosen mountain avens, which is sometimes known as white dryas, isn't it? Another version of its name, white dryad, um, or even eight-petaled mountain avens, sometimes in some textbooks. But if you want to go out searching for mountain uh, avens, uh, try and keep the, the uh, t to the mountains which are composed only of limestone. That really is its favoured environment. And um, any kind of limestone outcrops as well, you are liable to see mountain avens in that kind of area. That, that is really is ideal uh, favoured area. But when we look more closely and carefully at mountain avens, we notice that, yes, it is uh, an evergreen. But if you carefully lift up the more mature leaves and have a look uh, underneath those, those leaves, you will find that the undersides are covered in fine white hairs. Well, that's a bit of a surprise, isn't it? It, which appear to have been uh, flattened out against the leaf. So that type of arrangement of hairs on a leaf is called tomentos. So we can think of those as tomentos hairs, can't we? But uh, if you find uh, mountain avens uh, when it's in fruit, uh, also have a careful look at the fine patterns of hairs on those fruit themselves. And if I was to ask you a quiz question, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think uh, the, uh, the benefit to the fruit is of having th those hairs round? Well, the answer is, is that uh, the, the hairs actually protect the fruit when sometimes there are blasts of uh, mountain uh, wind right around there. But let's now continue moving north, shall we? Now we're, we're in central Norway, we can imagine that. And uh, we're now arrived at the Norwegian county of Nord Trondelag. To give you some idea of how sparse the human population is uh, in the county of Nord Trondelag, it, has, it measured just over 8,000 square miles, but has a population of only 135,000 people. That is a sparse population, let's be fair. As far as wildflowers go, they have chosen in the county of Nord uh, uh, Trondelag the beautiful ladies' slipper orchid. Yeah, it's, it's a surprise, isn't it? which the Norwegians called uh, Marisco. Now, a lot of cruise guests share your surprise. They are amazed to find Lady Slipper Orchid associated with a Norwegian county, which is in central Norway. So I need to explain just how tough these delicate-looking Lady Slipper Orchids uh, really are. And, and actually, if we were to look at maps of the world where Lady Slipper Orchids are found, it's amazing to find that these guys can crop up in Siberia, would you believe, in the Russian Far East. So whether it's, it's uh, in Norway or anywhere else, ladies' slipper orchid is best found in open woodland, but also limey soils as well. Now again, moving north, because time is against me, I know. Uh, I, n I need to uh, just, uh, take you to the Norwegian county of Nordland now, which is actually the second largest Norwegian county, so I, I had to uh, include it. 14,000 square miles, the wildflower is purple saxifrage, another type of saxifrage, uh, although some of you might know it as a mount, uh, purple mountain saxifrage, um, or, or even saxifraga or postif uh, tola. 
But uh, whatever you choose to call these beautiful uh, flowers, they have to uh, be admired for their sheer resilience, because purple saxifrage can withstand the most ferocious of uh, wind storms. And it's fairly common uh, as far north as the north of Greenland, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, these plants grow as far north as that. And in that area of northern Greenland, uh, th they have their place firmly in the record books as being the most northerly plant community in the world. And I can't see any challenge to that record uh, c coming along in, in the foreseeable future. Um, the, the altitude doesn't seem to bother them either. Um, you will find these guys certainly are, are not quite 15,000 feet above sea level, but uh, I think the record 14,800 feet, right up there in the Norwegian Alps. So they definitely uh, a tough little plant to, to uh, be fascinated about. What is the secret of their resilience, though, and their uh, success in extreme conditions? Well, if you actually get to see uh, uh, purple saxifrage, you will notice that they actually form a fascinating vegetation mat, which is very dense indeed. And so that is great for protection, isn't it? It's also a fairly loosely arranged mat with tiny pockets of not quite so cold air within that mat. So it just helps uh, to create a, t I won't call it a warmth, but not quite so uh, cold. But Having introduced you to the purple saxifrage, I now need to take you across the Arctic Circle to the county of Troms. Again, where well, we're heading on, on this uh, cruise. And I think this picture just about sums up uh, the county of, of Troms pretty well. It's an area um, not quite up to uh, 10,000 square miles, um, but punishing but beautiful terrain in equal uh, measure. The county uh, wildflower, uh, Bolblum, is, is the Norwegian name, and uh, better known to the most of us, a globe flower, that, that's what we'd recognize it, or Trolleus europaeus. Uh, but it's, again, amazingly adaptable. Um, it will grow up to two feet tall, which seems to be almost asking for trouble when you realize it's going to be blasted by uh, 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 winds. Um, but the secret to that impressive height in, an envir uh, in, in the, its chosen environment, which is uh, highly known for its ferocious blasting Arctic winds, is that it always choos chooses just sheltered spots. That's, that's the secret, really. Uh, and in particular, it also prefers damp and shaded areas as well. So it cuts down the risk of being destroyed by the, by the wind. So areas where it's being protected by the wind in woodland, for example, are absolutely perfect. And the scrubland uh, areas are also very good in, indeed. But the big question that I'm often asked, bearing in mind how far north these plants are, how do they get pollinated? That question comes up often. So I'm going to uh, anticipate it announce it right now. Of course, it's too far north for uh, bees, so flies get in on the act. And, and uh, it's a, a, a family of, of flies, Anthemiidae. So it's incredible to work out just how nature finds a way. Now, I'm going to take you right uh, to uh, the most northerly county of mainland Norway now. It's uh, chosen... Uh, wildflower, cloudberry, or, or you may, you may recognise it as bake apple, or if you come from Scotland, uh, Evron, you'd recognise that. So again, many names for it. Isn't it another surprise though, ladies and gentlemen, to find a cousin of raspberries and blackberries just so far north? Norway, of course, is full of fascinating surprises. Um, and uh, how does it survive uh, so far north? It's very clever. It buries most of itself underground, in, into the, the earth. And that's why so Scientists call it a rhizome because that's what rhizomes do. They bury a lot of their stem in the relative north, or relative warmth of the, the soil. And a final question that I'm often asked is what is the county flower of Svalbard? You know, that extraordinary archipelago of islands. I need to explain that Svalbard is not a county. It's not listed in the 19 counties of uh, uh, Norway. So that, that's why there is no county flower of Svalbard, because it's not a county. So th that's, that's, that's the answer to that, that little question. I know we've only had 45 minutes together, but I hope I've whetted your appetite to learn more about Norwegian wildflowers and to get there, out there on this vacation and future vacations. For me, though, I'm so grateful to you for giving me your time this evening and for listening to my talk. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.